3.5, we're going to talk about limits at infinity. I'll start off with just a little bit of a, a recall here. Do you remember if the limit as x approach a number of f of x equal plus or minus infinity, do you remember that they, that gave us an asymptote? So basically, when you could not cross out the problem on your limit, you had an asymptote. When you could cross it out, it's called a removable discontinuity, it's called a hole. This right here will give you an asymptote at the value of And we had two cases, really. We have this case, where we gave, went to the same infinity, positive infinity on both sides, and said the limit existed. The limit was positive infinity there. Or we had this case, where one went up, another went down. We said the limit didn't exist there. One's going to positive infinity as we go from the left, one's going to negative infinity as we go from the right. And we had a way to actually determine this, if you remember. Uh, how did we determine where we had holes or asymptotes? Sign tests would do this, but how do we find out where all this stuff happens? Let's pretend we had a rational function. Rational functions have denominators. How do you find these things? Okay, let me give you an example. <coughs> Will this have some discontinuities to it? Yeah. Absolutely. Where? At zero, one, three. Which ones? Zero. Is zero going to be a discontinuity? What do you think? Zero? No. Zero is fine. Zero over a number is okay. That's okay. Um, where are discontinuities going to exist? Three and negative one. Why? Good, because if a denominator equals zero, you have a problem, right? That's how you find discontinuities. That's what I told you, a domain, from a long time ago. So what do we do to find discontinuities? Denominator equals zero. That's how we do it. We, we said denominator equals zero. We solve it down. Uh, we're going to get either holes or asymptotes. Do you remember when we get holes and when we get asymptotes? Okay, we'll, maybe we'll refresh your memory on that next time. So if you'll recall, when we take a limit of a function as we approach some number and it goes to infinity, we're going to have an asymptote. We're going to have either an asymptote where the limit exists as they both go to positive infinity. I didn't draw the case where they both go to negative infinity. Or where one goes to positive and one goes to negative, and then we'd find that with the sign analysis test. Now, there were two cases where discontinuities existed. We had holes and we had asymptotes. Do you remember those, the holes and the asymptotes? Mm -hmm. The holes. was what was called a removable discontinuity. <coughs> what 
what it meant was that only a single point is missing from that function. One little single point. That was what defined a removable discontinuity. And it exists when the numerator and the denominator equals zero at the same time. Why was that the case? Well, if both the numerator and denominator equal zero at the same point, you're going to have a factor of x minus that value that you could cross out. Remember crossing out those, those problem areas? That was a removable discontinuity. Now, or a whole. If we don't have that, if the numerator equals a number and the denominator equals zero, and you cannot cross it out and you can't simplify it, it's not removable. That means we have an asymptote. So case two is where we had the asymptote. A vertical asymptote. <coughs> a vertical asymptote. This is when you can't cancel out, and I know you love to use that word cancel out, right? Where you can't cancel out the discontinuity, or you can't remove it. Let's do an example here real quick, okay? Let's do an example. Can you tell me where discontinuities exist? So any discontinuities. How about x equals zero? Is that a discontinuity or not? Is it okay to have zero on the top of a fraction? Sure, that's zero, that's a point. Uh, give me one discontinuity. One would work, sure, because if I plug in one, I'm going to get zero on the denominator, that's a discontinuity. You follow me? So x equals one will be a spot in which we will have a discontinuity. Give me another one, someone left hand side of the room. What do we have? Maybe three would be another one, sure. Now let me ask you a question about x equals one and x equals negative three. Are they holes? Are they asymptotes? Is one a hole? Is one an asymptote? What do you think? And the answer to the question is, can you cross out where the discontinuity happens? So basically, can you cross out the x minus 1? Can you cross out the x plus 3? So are those holes or asymptotes? So those are both asymptotes, both of them. Now stop for a second, just watch. What if I had done this, please? Which one would be the asymptote in this case? That would be the asymptote here. And that would be a removable discontinuity, or in other words, a hole. Do you follow that? OK, good. So I'm going to change it back to this. This is an asymptote. And that's an asymptote. If I have just x over x plus 3 and x minus 1, those are vertical asymptotes. Do you recall how to find out what the limit is around those? Do you remember that? Yep, side analysis, how you do it. You'd put the negative 3, and you know it's going to be an asymptote, because we just talked about that. It's going to be an asymptote there. And you put the positive 1, and you know it's going to be an asymptote. And then all you have to do is plug in some numbers for those intervals, because look at look. If it's an asymptote, look at the board here real quick, you know it's going to be one of these cases, right? It's either going to go this, that, or be opposite. So it's going to be one of those. All you have to do is plug in numbers. If it's positive, it's going positive. If it's negative, it's going negative. Same thing in here. Positive, positive, negative, negative. Same thing here. Positive or negative. Now, there's one thing you have to be careful of. One very important thing for us right now. Do you see that the numerator will equal 0 at 0? That point's not going to be an asymptote, but it will, it will change the, the sign of your fraction. So you're going to put a little marker in here at 0. And the only reason why you're going to do it is because a number in this region could potentially be different than a number in this region concerning the sign. Does that make sense to you? So that's a separator. Because if you just plug in 0, you're going to get 0, right? That doesn't tell you positive or negative. That could be a case where you're switching from positive to negative. So you have to put that, plug in a number here, and plug in a number here, and that'll tell you. So it's like having 4 here. You have just three intervals, but that's a separating marker which says 
I can't plug in just one number here, I need to plug in two different numbers. So you only have two asymptotes. There's not three asymptotes, but it's like, yes, like you're testing four intervals. Okay. <clears throat> Feel okay with this? Why don't we see what happens? Uh, why don't you plug in negative four? So how about this? Uh, U2 rows do negative four. U2 rows do negative one. U2 rows do 0.5. And U2 rows do two. Okay, can you tell me that? Have you already done the two? <coughs> when you have them, let me know. It's negative? So you plug, you plug into here, right? You get negative. I don't care what the value, negative. It's going to do that. Uh, these two rows, have you plugged in negative one? Yet? Negative. Negative? Really? Negative, positive, negative, positive. How about 0.5? Positive, positive, negative. negative. How about 2? Here's my question. Will the limit exist? Will the limit exist as we approach negative 3? From the left, we're going down. From the right, we're going up. Does it exist? Heck no. How about at 1? No. Nope. From the left, we're going down. From the right, we're going up. If they had been like this, both going up, both going down, sure. How about this question, trick question? Uh, does the limit exist at zero? Yeah. Absolutely, that's a point. There's no asymptote there. Right? That's a point, limit does exist at zero. Ah, trick job. Take a job. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Feel okay with it so far? Could you do the same thing with something like this? Same thing as something like that. Can you tell me where discontinuities exist on this problem? Where would they exist on this problem? Do you need to distribute all this out to tell, tell that? The only place where discontinuities are going to exist is where the denominator equals zero. True? So where the denominator equals zero is where this little piece equals zero. You follow? Where is that going to equal zero? Uh-huh. <coughs> so these are my discontinuities. Would you say that those are holes or asymptotes? Explain why they're asymptotes. Okay, they can't be removed. That's exactly right. Can't be deleted is what you said, but absolutely. If, even if you factored that, could you cross it out at all? <coughs> Definitely not. So these are non-removable discontinuities. Those are asymptotes. So how could you find out where those asymptotes go? Well, this says, really what we're concerned about is around the 1. Do you see what I'm talking about? So from our, our chart here, we've got two discontinuities. We've got negative 1. We've got 1. One and negative one. And what we're going to do is check where these asymptotes go. Now, look up here at the board here real quick. Normally, we would check all the asymptotes. Follow? But which one do I really care about? Do I care about the negative one? No. Why not? Limit says one, so I don't care about that. I care about this. Sure. Tell me one more point that I absolutely must have up here right now. Zero. That's zero. That zero could be a change of sign. So where the numerator equals zero, that could also be a place where you want to at least separate your interval. It's not going to be an asymptote. But you definitely want to plug in, just to be safe, a number between zero and one. That's what you want to do. So try that. People on the left-hand side, why don't you try 0.5? Right-hand side, why don't you try 2 for me? See what happens around that. <clears throat> shouldn't really be able to do it without a calculator, honestly. Um, because when you think about it, this is going to be a positive number, right? 
positive, it doesn't matter, that's positive. Positive over positive is positive. Oh. Really? Positive. 0.5 is a positive number. You didn't check negative, did you? Because we should be checking between this little interval. That's why we have that. Okay. 0.5 is positive. This is positive. Positive or positive? Positive. Aha! Ah. We did this the first time. I think we've had one of these. Does the limit exist? Yes. Yes, it does. This limit, as t approaches 1, of that nasty looking function is what? Can you tell me? Infinity. Positive or negative? Positive. 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 So are sign analysis is important? Are sign uh, analysi? How do you say that? <laughs> analysis? Analyses. Analyses. Oh, that's better. Are sign analyses important for you? <laughs> are they important? Yeah, you yeah. gotta know how to do those. So when you can cross out, it's very easy. Those are holes. No problem. When you can't cross them out, you have to have some way to determine where they're going. And the way you do that is with a sign analysis, just like that. Don't worry about all the asymptotes if I don't ask them to for you. Worry about just where the limit says. If I'm asking for the, all these continuities, I'm just asking for the points, right? This was a little extra for us in that case. I just wanted to see what happened. This is the application for a limit. Question, I feel okay with this so far. All right, good. Now, the next question we have to answer is, what happens with the limit if x doesn't actually go to a number? So for instance, x goes to 1 here, right? Or t in this case, a variable goes to, to 1. What if we say, I don't want to go to 1, I don't want to go to 2, I want to go to infinity. What happens to our function? I don't want to go to negative 3, I don't want to go to negative 4, I want to go to negative infinity. What happens to our function? That's what this next part is all about. So the question is, what happens in a limit, or to a function, as x approaches positive infinity, as far as we can, we can go, or negative infinity? Basically, x increases forever or decreases forever. What happens to our function? Let's take a look at two examples that are going to give us some insight as to this. table just to kind of get a, a picture of what's going on. We'll have <clears throat> x and f of x. And we'll start very easily. We'll start at 1, 10, 100, and then a million. <clears throat> Let's do it for this one. What would happen, please, if x equal to 1, what would we get? How about x equal 10, what would we get? 0.1. Okay. 0.1. Very good. Or 110. Yeah, clearly, right? 1 over whatever that number is. How about 100? 0 0.01. How about a million? 0.501. Six zeros, right? Five zeros. Five, five zeros? Yeah, five zeros. What if x equaled a trillion? Would it get bigger or smaller? Smaller. What's it going to? Is it ever going to reach zero? But think about this. You're dividing a constant number by infinity, right? Like when you're a little kid and you go, you're wrong. Well, you're more wrong. Well, you're wrong plus 10. Well, you're wrong times infinity. Ha 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 Right? Well, if you did divide it by infinity, you'd have like, you have zero. You keep dividing by a bigger and bigger number, you're going to get zero, right? One divided by a billion is very close to zero. One divided by a zillion, that's a number, right? number. 
is very close to zero. But you keep getting bigger and bigger, this quantity is closer and closer to zero. Are you with me on that? Zero. Let's talk about negative infinity. What happens as you go closer to negative infinity? Well, that would be, I'm just going to change this. That would be negative, 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 negative. True? Negative, 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 negative. Is it still approaching zero? <coughs> yes. As we go to negative infinity, we're also approaching zero. <coughs> what this says is that if f of x, our function, gets really, really close to a number as we approach infinity, then the limit exists. So we can take limits as x approaches one of these infinities if x approaches an actual number. idea of really close to, that was the idea of that limit. If f of x gets really close to a number, as x approaches infinity, plus or minus, whichever one, <coughs> then the limit exists. the limit exists, what's it stand for? What's it mean? Think about this. Let's say that you start taking your function and you start going forever in that direction. Well, it's almost like a karate move. <coughs> I don't take karate. I don't know, but it kind of feels like it. Whatever. The limit move. So, if you, if, by the way, if you ever try to do the math karate, you're going to get your, you're going to beat up. Never do math karate. So you go this way, forever and ever and ever. And your function is going to the same number. Is it ever going to get to that number? No. no. It's getting very, 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 very close, right? What idea do we have that represents that? No. But not a vertical one. A vertical one says you're going to get really close to that, right? And never reach it. That's the same idea we have going this way. You're really close to that, but you're, oh, then we don't have this idea. We only have one, because otherwise we don't have a function. But we have this idea. We're going to get close to a number or close to a number close to a number or close to a number. That's a horizontal asymptote. So now we have two types of asymptotes. Vertical happens when you have discontinuities that are not removable. Shake your head or nod your head if you're okay with that. Horizontal happens when you take a limit of your function to infinity. And that's the idea. Horizontal asymptotes. By the way, the same rules apply to these limits we're about to do. Uh, the rules for limits as x approaches negative and positive infinity are the same as before. So the same rules apply. Everything it, it holds the same. Which means one thing for us. <coughs> Consider this. <coughs> what if we take any, any 1 over x to the n power? Do you recall from limits that I can take the limit of the function and then raise it to the power? Do you remember that? That we could pull out the exponent? That was one of our prime rules. That helped us a lot. Well. Notice how 1 to the n is always just going to be 1, right? So then this is true. That's a true statement. That's 1 over n. I'm sorry, 1 to the n, that's 1. This is x to the n, that's x to the n. Are you guys okay with that statement? Well, tell me something then. How much is the limit of 1 over x as we approach infinity? What's 0 to the nth power? So that's it. what this says in English is that any function where you're dividing a constant, 1, because you can pull a constant out, any constant can be pulled out of that limit, any constant by some variable, 
that's being raised, or the, the, as x approaches to that, that infinity, is going to end up being zero. It's going to have a horizontal asymptote at zero. Zero to the n, or zero. Does it make a difference if we're talking about negative infinity? Let's consider that. Let's go to negative infinity. Negative infinity. That means, is this still true for negative infinity? Absolutely. Is this still true? Is 1 over x as x approaches negative infinity, is that still 0? 0 to this, that holds true for both of them. What this says is that 1, a constant over any variable that's being taken to infinity, is going to give you a horizontal asymptote. How many people feel okay with that, with that idea? No matter what the power is, squared, cubed, doesn't matter, because you're always taking that 1 over x to that power. 1 over x, as x approaches infinity, either positive or negative, it's going to be 0. 0 to any power is still 0. Interesting thing. Horizontal asymptotes, in each case, at 0. Now, before we get into some other computational stuff, let me show you one more idea. Right now, we've done a lot of theory so far, so there's no, not really a whole lot of examples. We're going to change that in just a minute. But I've got to talk about one more. I want you to think of polynomials. Let's talk about the limit of a polynomial as x approaches positive or negative infinity. Think about what you know. Think what you know about polynomials. Would you agree that polynomials are in one of these four one, two, three, one of these four cases? Polynomials are either like this, like this, like this, or like that. True? Because think about x squared. X squared like this. Does it ever go to an actual number as we go this way? Does it ever go down or up or into, and go to? No, polynomials don't do that. Polynomials always have a tail somewhere. Uh, an x cubed would go this way to that way, right? Negative x cubed goes this way to this way. X squared goes this way. Negative x squared goes this way. They never actually go to an actual number. They're all either going to positive or negative infinity. So as we approach, for any polynomial, positive or negative infinity on the x-axis, the function itself approaches positive or negative infinity on the y-axis. Let me say that one more time because I think I lost something. As you travel this way on the x, your function is doing one of two things. Going this way, forever, or going this way, forever. You follow me on that one? That's what I just said. Okay. If you're going this way on the x-axis, your function is doing one of two things. Going this way forever, or going this way forever. That's what this says. The limit of a polynomial as x approaches negative infinity or positive infinity goes to positive or negative infinity itself. I'll give you some examples of this. By the way, you're going to notice that I always use positive and negative infinity. That's something I do because I don't like to get confused. I, I, if I say positive, I, I write the positive. That's just the way I do it. Do you have to do it that way? No, not necessarily. Helps me. Helps me. Let's get, let's consider this, okay? <coughs> now, infinity is not something we can actually plug in, but it's something we can think about. In fact, this one guy actually went crazy thinking about the sizes of infinity because there's different sizes of infinity, which is pretty interesting in itself. But, so thinking about infinity is kind of weird to think about, uh, but we can do it. Think about this. Take a big positive number, 
plug it in x cubed. You know the shape of x cubed, right? It's a polynomial. It's going to be like this. Take a positive number and plug it in. Do you get a positive or negative? Take a bigger number. Is it still positive? Yeah. Take a bigger number. Is it still positive? In fact, it's getting bigger and bigger. This is going to go to positive infinity. <clears throat> the bigger the positive number I plug in, the bigger the positive number I get out. Let's try this one. <coughs> negative infinity. Take a negative number, plug it in. What do you get? Mm -hmm. Take a smaller negative number, even more negative, plug it in. Do you still get negative? Do you see that this one's actually going to negative infinity? Further we go left on the number line, the further we go down on the y-axis. Negative infinity. And that's what that says. The further you go left, the further your function drops. That's what that's saying. Does that make sense to you? How about this one, x squared? Take a positive number, plug it in x squared. Where are you going, up or down? Up, uh, positive infinity. So the bigger the positive number, the bigger the positive number. Try that one, though. Take a negative number, plug it in. What do you get? Aha, uh -huh, a positive. Because x squared takes that number and, and makes it positive. So even though we're going to the left, our function is going up. That's why x squared looks like that, right? It's going to go up on both sides. This is also positive infinity. Show of hands, how many people feel okay with our, our limit idea so far? Good, all right, all right. By the way, this is kind of an interesting little note. Also, did you know, did you know that the behavior of the polynomial itself will follow the behavior of the leading term? Did you know that? I'll explain that in a second. Sorry, I'll say it this way. Limits of a polynomial will follow the behavior of the highest, highest power term. Now the polynomial, nothing else, polynomial. quick example because I, I think you'll really handle this pretty well. Let's say that I want to talk about the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 3x cubed minus 2x squared minus x plus 9. Now, <laughs> here's what you can't do. What you can't do is go, oh, let's see. Uh, negative infinity cubed, negative infinity times negative, that's positive infinity, minus a positive infinity, that's, oh, uh, man, I don't know. If you start doing stuff like that, subtracting infinities, that is going to make you go crazy. Okay? <laughs> what you need to understand is that all this subtracting and adding the infinities are meaningless. The behavior of this polynomial is going to follow the term that has the largest power. The term that has the largest power is usually in front, it doesn't have to be, but it's usually in front of your polynomial. It's this one. Here's what this little corollary says, what this actually theorem says. It says this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of just the negative 3x cubed. Don't forget the negative, that's important but the negative 3x cubed. You know this intuitively. In fact, when you think about it, look at that. The power is 3. Don't you automatically know it's going to be S-curve? For sure it's going to be doing this. A power 4 would look like this. 5, 6, 7, 8. You know that, right? Now negatives would be opposite. So negative x cubed 
negative of that, I did write, no, I'm going to Nancy uh, Negative x cubed, negative x to the fourth, negative x to the fifth, negative x to the fifth. It's going to do that, right? You know that intuitively. So it follows that leading term. All the rest of this is garbage as far as another is concerned, really, when you're talking about infinity. Now, normal limits, no, it's not garbage, but for infinity, that's the one that matters. So consider the, the leading term, that negative 3x to the third. Take, we're going to negative infinity, mind you. Take and do this. Negative means negative, right? It means a negative number. Take a negative number, plug it in here. What do you get out? And then multiply it by negative 3. What do you get, a positive or negative? Positive. That's positive. So as we're approaching negative infinity, that approaches positive infinity. It's a polynomial. We'll go to 1 infinity. Let me do this one more time so you really catch this on. You're talking about going to really negative numbers, right? Really negative. Plug in negative numbers to that, you're going to get out negative numbers, right? But then you're multiplying it by negative 3, which makes them positive numbers. That's positive infinity. Think about negative x cubed. If you think about negative x cubed, it looks like this, doesn't it? I'm about like that. Let's see if I move my arms a little bit there. It looks about like that. I know, right? Doing dance dance revolution or something. Uh, it, it's this. As you go left, it goes higher, doesn't it? As you go right, it goes low. That's what this is saying. That's what that's saying. How many people feel okay with that one? I'm not trying to show limits here. Just ask. Okay. Now we're going to start using these ideas to actually compute some limits. This is where kind of the fun comes in. We're back to computing limits. Are they hard? Not really. But you need to know not tricks, but some mathematical manipulations to do them correctly. There's going to be a lot of rationalization, a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of dividing by things. There's a lot of that. Not hard, though. You just got to see it a few times. Okay. Let's see if we can do that. What about that? Uh, where are we going? <coughs> positive infinity. Big, really big numbers. So plug in positive. What's five times positive infinity? Positive. Infinity. Positive, right? Minus two. Positive. Infinity. <laughs> what's three times infinity? Positive. Plus nine. We got you infinity plus one. Ha 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 ha. What? Infinity over infinity. One. Yes? No? No, you can't do that. Do you know how big infinity is? Me neither. So how are you supposed to divide it and get one? You can't, you can't do that. But maybe we can manipulate this in such a way that this stuff is possible. Now here's the idea. Did you know that you can multiply both the top and the bottom of a fraction by anything that you want? And if you multiply both the top and the bottom of the fraction by anything you want, it goes to both of those terms, true? What that says is this. What if I divided every term by x? Could I do it? Mathematically, is that legal? Sure. Mathematically, that's fine. Five x minus two, three x, plus 9. Let's divide all those terms by x. I'll explain where I'm getting the x from in just a minute. Now, some of you can probably see it. I'll explain why in a bit. You okay with that so far? You sure? Okay. Now, simplify. What happens here? X just came out. Same thing happens here, right? Do they cancel out or cross out here? No. So I get the limit v 
this becomes 5 minus 2 over x, 3 plus 9 over x. By a show of hands, how many people can follow that algebra down? Now, watch. Let's take x to infinity. If I take x to infinity, what happens to the 5? Nothing. Nothing. There's no x. It doesn't change at all. The 5 is 5. What happens to the 3? Nothing. What happens to 2 over x? It's really small. Really small. How small? Zero. Zero. Remember the definition of our limit? Our limit said, as we take x approaches infinity, a constant over x is the first thing I gave you today, really, the first new thing. It said a constant over x to any power goes to what? Zero. That was important. We needed that. This becomes how much, folks? Everybody. Zero. How much does this become? Zero. Constant over infinity. Whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. It's going to zero. So what this says is this limit, notice how I'm going to stop writing limit now. I've written limit till here. 5 minus 0 over 3 plus 0. That's 5 thirds. Not 1. 5 thirds. Now, is it coincidental? Is it coincidental that, uh, by the way, this works because you do 1 over x over 1 over x. Do you guys see what I'm talking about there? What I really did mathematically was this over that. Do you see it? 1 over x over 1 over x, and that distributed, and that basically divided every term by x. And that's the mathematical way you'd show that. Look at the first, look at the first uh, expression, the limit of 5x minus 2 over 3x plus 9. What's the leading term here? 5x is the leading term. What's the leading term here? What are the coefficients? Do you see that when I divide, <coughs> excuse me, when I divide by that x, I'm going to get 5 thirds. Everything else is going to go to 0. So the lead, those are polynomials. The leading term is all that really matters for us for that. Now, do you have to show it? Yeah, I'd like you to show it for right now. Okay? As you're going on, you know, later math classes, no problem. But, but show me that. Where you get an x from is not the common x here. You're actually only looking at the denominator. And what you're going to do is divide every term by the largest power of x in the denominator. You should probably write that down. Now, why not the numerator? Well, think about it. If your, if your exponents don't exactly match up and you start dividing by the largest power in the numerator, you could have a lot of undefined things. Does that make sense? For instance, if you had this uh, x to the fourth over x cubed, and you divide it by x to the fourth, you'd have other stuff here. But if you divide it by x to the fourth, that's undefined. That's 1 over x. That's a bad thing. So it's always by the largest power in the denominator. That way, you won't be undefined. You might be going to infinity, but you won't be undefined. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Another way uh, people like to say this, uh, I'm not going to write it down. It's kind of it's a, it's a shortcut. Uh, but if your if your powers are equal to each other, you're going to the coefficient over the coefficient. That's what we have here. But you can see that that's going to work, right? X squared over x squared, x cubed over x, no problem. If your power is larger on the numerator than the denominator, well, you divide by this power, this is still going to have an x up there somewhere, right? That's infinity, either positive or negative infinity. If this one is larger than, I'm sorry, smaller than this one, if this one's larger, well, then you're going to be going to zero. Because you divide by this one, no x is here, x here, you're going to zero. That's one way you can look at that as well. So if the top still has an x, you're going to infinity? Of course. Let's try a couple more. You're going you're gonna to start seeing this very easily. It's not going to be something super duper hard. What's going to be super duper hard is when we combine this with some other ideas in a little while. Actually, not even super duper hard then. Just super hard. Not even the duper. Don't worry about the duper. <laughs> Come on, that was, fun. that was funny. Among others. <laughs> <clears throat> if
if you were listening to what I was talking about, you could probably tell me where this limit is going right off the bat. Zero. Not one third. Zero. If the power's matched up, it would. Where's the power the biggest? That means what we're going to be doing here to show your work, you're going to be dividing everything not by x squared, mm -mm, but by x to the third power. X to the third power. You follow me on that? So this would look just like this. You'd have 5x squared over x to the third minus 4x over x to the third. All over. Everything is divided. Everything. 15x to the third over x to the third minus 3 over x to the third. <coughs> If we do just a little of simplification, well, look what happens. Do you see how this power is still going to be 5 over x? And this is going to be 4 over x squared. You see the x squared? This is going to be 15, sure, but this is going to be 3 over x to the third. We had that. that the principles of beginning class for a reason. It said any constant over any power of x as x approaches any infinity is going where, folks? Where? Zero. 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 So where's this going? Zero. 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 Where's this going? Zero. Where's this going? Zero. Oh, come on. Come on. Everyone got to play along. Where's this going? Zero. 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 Fifteen. Zero. Zero. So this, after you stop writing limit, would be 0 minus 0 over 15 minus 0. That's where these things are going. It's a constant over x as x approaches infinity. Negative infinity, but still an infinity. 0, 0, 0, 0. How much is that going to be? 0. That's 0. That says a horizontal asymptote. That's what this is, by the way, a horizontal asymptote as you're going to the left. Are you following me on that? Now, if you did this, if you reciprocated this, and you divide everything by x squared, do you see how you still have an x on the numerator? That would be saying you're going to positive or negative infinity, depending on what, uh, what x is approaching. <clears throat> Let's do one more, and then next time we'll start building on this concept. Two more, two more. We get, we get three minutes now. Again, some of you who kind of understand this, this concept right now should probably be able to tell me where this is going to approach, or at least have a guess what it's going to approach. Negative infinity. Okay. Positive infinity. Okay. Ooh, battle royale. That's out. Well, you might want to do the work to make sure, but do you see it's not going to go to a constant? Do you see it's not going to go to zero? What are we going to divide by? x cubed, x squared, or x? The largest power in the denominator. So show your work. Don't get lazy on that. Don't take a guess, because some of you were guessing right now. Don't take a guess. Show your work. Over x. Over x. Over x. All over. That. Divide everything by the largest power in the denominator, not the numerator. That give you undefined spots. Do you see that? If I divide it by x cubed, I get a whole bunch of undefined stuff. Can't have that. Can't do that. Are you alright with that one so far? Simplify them. You're going to get 7x squared minus 2x plus 1 over x, all over 9 over x minus 2. <coughs> you follow me on that? Now let's kind of think carefully about what happens here. What happens? 
Where's that go? That goes to positive infinity. Does this stuff matter? No. That goes to positive infinity. Agreed? It's x squared. This is 0, but that is a negative 2. Where's that going? Negative infinity. In fact, if you really wanted me to show it to you this way, I could. Couldn't you factor out a negative and get 2 minus 9 over x? Move the negative up top. Negative infinity. Bam. Got it. Do you see it? Did I lose you? You understand that went to positive infinity? A little unorthodox here, but you see this goes to zero. Negative two doesn't change. Positive divided by negative is a yeah. infinity divided by two, still infinity. Yeah. <laughs> now mathematically, oh, oh not that. <laughs> it doesn't do that. <laughs> that. Yeah. Mathematically, the way that you could show this is the way I showed you. If you factor out the negative, it's negative 2 minus 9 over x, right? If you take that negative and move to the top of your fraction, which is legal to do, it goes there. That becomes 2 minus 9 over x. That says this goes to infinity times a negative. That's negative infinity. But divided by a positive now, that's negative infinity. That's what that means as well. Can we show it the way the other one's going to yeah. By the way, did anything but the highest powers of x have anything to do with our problem here? This one and that one is really what, what caused this to be the way it was. That. Uh, one last thing I'll leave you with, just this idea. Because I want you to look at some of your homework tonight, but I don't want you to be completely afraid of it. Just a little afraid. That looks pretty nasty, but tell me something that I can do with exponents. What can you do? Not yet. I can move them outside. Is a root a type of exponent? Then look. You could take a cube root of the limit. Now, ignore the cube root for a second, just for a second, though. Can you do this limit? Yeah. Explain to me how you would do this limit. What would you divide by here? X, X which one? X squared. X squared. Hey, where's this limit going to go from the in, on the inside? Two do you see the two thirds? Uh, two thirds. And then take a cube root of that. So our answer here, after you show the work, would be a cube root of two thirds. The work you show is, is this. You show a cube root, 2x squared over x squared, minus 3 over x squared, all over <coughs> that. That's what you show, but that's the answer you get. How many people are stood today? I feel okay with it. Right side people, are you guys over this so far? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we're talking about how to do limits as x approaches infinity. Now, the last example I gave you, I think I gave you that one, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I said that when you have a cube root, it is a power. That means you can pull it outside of our limit and says, well, let's take the cube root of our limit itself. Now, when you do that, that's kind of nice, right? Because we know how to take these limits. <coughs> but what we would normally do is divide everything by the largest power in the denominator. That's x squared. You would get 2. That's going to be 0. 3. That's going to be 0 you're going to get two-thirds. You, you follow? Mm -hmm. Don't forget about the cube root, but your answer is two-thirds with a cube root around it. I think that's what I gave you last time. Did, were you okay with that one? Yeah. Now, I, I showed you that one again because I want you to consider the problem that's just below it. Can I do the same thing here? For instance, can I pull out the square root around the whole limit? No. No, because that square root's not around this whole function. It's just on the numerator. So. Oh my gosh, well, what do we do? 
what do we do? Well, let's, let's try to stick with the, the normal operation of this. When we're taking x to infinity, we can't just go, well, that's infinity squared. Okay, that's still infinity. Plus 2 to infinity. Square roots infinity over infinity. Uh, 1. We can't do that. But what we did say was, maybe we divide by the largest power of x in the denominator. denominator. So we're going to look down there. What's the largest power of x in the denominator? One. x to the first power. So let's divide the numerator and the denominator by x. <coughs> Are you okay with that so far? Well now here's the issue, and some of you might see this issue already, can I just take this x inside that square root? I can't unless I have a square root. Remember, you can only combine, combine things if you have the same exact type of root. Follow? Because it's, it's an exponent. You can only put things together if you have the same type of exponent. Well, well, that's a problem. Does anyone know how to change x into something that I can take into that square root? Let's think about it for a second. Let's think about that x. What do you think? But if I do x squared, I have to change those to x squared, yeah. right? Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. That would be 0 and 0. That would be undefined. So I can't just arbitrarily change to x squared, but you're on the right track. One, two, two, over two. 2 over 2 is still 1. <laughs> x over x. x over x. Y. I did 1 over x. I did that. So x squared down here, we definitely, we can't have an x squared. I need this to still be a value of x. Make it a value of x. x squared's a great idea. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. That's too much. The, say what now? Root of x times root of x is still x. You're close. Oh, you're so close. You're so close. Put that together. You want something that equals x, true? How do you make this equal x? Do that. And they are equal. Is that equal? OK. No, no, but almost. That's our idea, though. I'm going to fix this in a second. So here's, here's the plan. Why well, know that I need this? Do you see why I need that? That is still, well, pretty much x, almost x. And that's going to allow me to take that into that square root. Do you follow me? That's important. But the question is, is x equal to the square root of x squared? And the answer is no. Not really. Because if you think about it, why don't you take like a negative number, negative 5. Is negative 5 equal to the square root of negative 5 squared? No, it's not. Because as soon as you square it, it becomes positive, right? So this is not necessarily true. What is true is this. That's true. So if we have to have this, there's something that's wrong in our problem right now. This is right. What is wrong? Do you see it? You don't see it. Um, let me go through the process one more time. You knew, maybe if I draw in purple, it'll make more sense. You knew if you, you had to do that, right? But you knew that this wouldn't work. So to try to make it equivalent, you did this. That would go into, into the square root. However, this fails now because this is not equal. That's not equal. Notice you, you're trying to divide everything by the same thing, right? The same thing. So if you have divided by the same thing, these are not the same thing. This is the same thing. That's true. This is true. Yes, this is not true. Not necessarily true. So are the absolute value important? This is almost true. Is this true? Well, no. Almost. This is true. <clears throat> you ready to keep going? Did you understand that, that idea right now? You sure? Okay, so when we take the square root of x squared, we can't just have x, you have to have the absolute value of x. And I'll show you why it's important in maybe 10 minutes. 
For right now, let's continue working on this problem. When you have a square root over a square root, that says you can take a square root of the whole entire fraction. That's x squared over x squared plus 2 over x squared. Are you okay on where the x squared over x squared and 2 over x squared are coming from? That's the whole solely reason why you, sole reason why you did that, right? Just to make that in there. Over 3x over the absolute value of x minus 6 over the absolute value of x. Well, that's a limit. x goes to positive infinity. You're going to have the square root of 1 plus 2 over x squared. All, okay, okay. Now we've got to deal with that. I need your mind to think back to what it means to be an absolute value. Absolute value is actually a piecewise function. The piecewise function says if x is positive, you leave it alone. If x is negative, you change the sign. Does that make sense to you? If x is positive, positive, you leave it alone. If x is negative, you change the sign. And that was the whole idea. That's the piecewise definition of absolute value. Do you remember that? I think we did in here, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, this is how you apply that. We are going to have the 3x <coughs> over minus 6 over. Now you get to change your absolute value of x depending on where you are going, whether you go into positive infinity or negative infinity. Where are we going? To positive numbers or negative numbers? Positive. We're going to positive, num positive numbers say that absolute value of x equals x. Positive numbers, positive numbers, say that absolute value of x equals x. Are you with me on this? Absolute value of x, now you don't need the absolute value. You just know that since I'm going to positive numbers, that can become the x. It might seem trivial, like, well, if it's just going to change to x anyway, why do we need the absolute value? Trust me, you need them. I'll show you why in a couple minutes, OK? Now in like five minutes. What is you going to feel OK with that so far? You see, now that we have that, those x's do match up. Those x's are gone. You get a limit to positive infinity. 1 plus 2 over x squared all over 3 minus 6 over x. Tell me some nice things that happen since x is going to positive infinity. Tell me what happens. Where does this go? Zero. One. Not zero. One. This, the one. Oh. one. The one goes to one. It's constant. Do constants go anywhere? No. no. Where does this go? Where does the fraction go? Zero. Have we lost it all? OMG, you're scaring me, people. You're scaring me here. Undefined. Limits of constants are constants. Limits of this is not undefined. Where's x going? X is going to infinity. Where's this fraction going? Zero. A constant over infinity is zero. Divide a constant by infinity. How much are you going to get? Zero. Think about that. Come on. Where's three going? Three. Okay. Where's this going? Zero. Don't forget what we did last time. This says you're going to do 1 plus 0 over 3 minus 0. Tell me my final answer, please. What is that? Are you okay getting a 0 and a 0? I think we talked about that last time. A constant over any power of x as x approaches infinity is going to be 0. Because this number is getting huge, and this number is getting huge, and those numbers are staying the same. That means you're going to have a number over huge. A number over huge is 0. <coughs> One third. Not the square root of one. Okay, one third. Show of hands, how many would feel okay with that? Now, I want you to consider this. Why this is important. Think about it. You can change your problem if you want to. I'm not going to do the whole example over again. I'm not going to give you two examples. I'm going to show you with this. Let's say that that is now negative. That means that's negative. Is this still possible? Absolutely. Yeah. Is this still true? Absolutely. Is that still okay? Yes. Now,
At this point, something different would happen. At this point, from here to here. You see, if we're going to negative infinity, that means that for our absolute value of x, where are we going? Are we going we're not going here anymore. We're not dealing with positive numbers, we're dealing with negative numbers. That means instead of absolute value of x equaling x, absolute value of x would equal <laughs> negative x. That means that this and that would be there. Do you see the change? This would be okay. Squared, right? Squared's going to be positive no matter what. That's where our definition came from. But this would be different. What's <coughs> 3x over negative x? <laughs> Minus 6 over negative, well, that's a plus. That's not really an effect because that's being plus 0. But this definitely affects us, doesn't it? That's negative 3 plus negative 3 plus 0. That's negative 1 third, not positive 1 third. What that says is this is interesting. The first time we've had this, because if you've been thinking about it, you might have said, well, why do we even take positive infinity and negative infinity? Why don't we just do one infinity and consider it a horizontal asymptote the whole way? Well, it doesn't work. Look at that. Our first example was positive infinity, right? That's that way. That was at a horizontal, and remember what these are? A horizontal asymptote? That's a horizontal asymptote at one third. <coughs> if you go to the left, negative infinity, is it at one third? No, it's at negative one third. So our horizontal asymptotes can be different as you go to positive infinity and negative infinity. That proves it. That's different right there. A lot of people understood that. Cool. This really is right with that. Hopefully that made sense to you. We're going to do uh, one more example, maybe two, just to start it off. Let's try that. Uh, show you something kind of cool, interesting that you can do. So we give it a try? Looks awesome to me. I don't know about you. Looks awesome to me. Let's try. Ready? Uh, what's infinity to the fourth power? Infinity. infinity. Okay, cool. Plus two? Infinity. And the square root of that. And then minus, so infinity, how much is infinity squared? Infinity. Zero. All right, done. I love that. <laughs> Woo! Easy problems. Yeah? No. Of course, it may be coincidentally, but I really doubt it. We can't do that. You can't just plug in infinities. It, it, whenever you get a, a case where you're like infinity minus infinity or infinity over infinity, something like that, you know something bad's happening. All right? <laughs> yeah, you're not doing something right. So you can't ever do that. If you get infinity over infinity, please, for heaven's sakes, don't put one. Because mm. that, that would have been one, right? Uh, we can't do that. Well, what we do have to do is manipulate the problem somehow. Now, in this case, you have a root, <coughs> you have a root minus something. What's one thing we like to do with roots minus something when we can't work on them any other way? We usually try to, try to rationalize somehow, right? Now this doesn't have a denominator, so make one. Put it over what? Put it over one. Get yourself a denominator. Then you're going to try to rationalize. Conjugate. Very good. Conjugate, if you want to be fancy about it. <laughs> Is it plus 2 or minus 2 there, by the way? Plus 2. Good. So this sign doesn't change. This sign does change. And it's over exactly the same thing. Are you okay with that so far? Yes or no? Well, the denominator has nothing to distribute, which is really nice. We don't have to do any work up there. The numerator, just distribute it carefully. You know with conjugates, your middle term should be bye-bye, right? Your middle term should be gone. We know also that conjugate works this way because you know, the square root times the square root gives you the radicand. That's inside. That's nice. So our limit <coughs> to positive infinity becomes something over the square root of x to the fourth plus 2 plus x squared. The numerator becomes, oh, what's the numerator become? x to the fourth plus 2 minus 
Distribute, right? Do you see that on your distribution? Because you should have those. X to the fourth plus two. We're going to have plus and minus the same exact thing. And then we're going to get what's the last thing? You see the minus X to the fourth two? Don't forget about the exponent. If you make the exponent <coughs> incorrect, if you make the exponent incorrect, it's not going to come out right. So you know, really be careful about your distribution. Don't forget to distribute that last part. You got me? What happens here that's nice? Yeah, oh, that's great. I love that. Two square root of x to the fourth plus two plus x squared. So far, so good? Okay. Hmm. Can we do that legally? Can we just say 2 over infinity? Well, I don't know. Especially if this is a, especially if you did this. Especially if you did that, that would be a big problem. Do you see that? That would be an issue. So what we're going to do is make sure about it. You're going to start dividing by the largest power in the denominator. Again, just like you normally would. So, what's the largest power in the, especially if I give you this one, okay? What if that was 2x? That would be a big problem. This one, yeah, Scott's right. You probably could look at this and go, that's 2, that's infinity, plus, in, that's infinity. There's no way that that's not going to be infinity, you got me? This is going to go to 0. He's right. But to check your work, especially if you have something like this, that might not go to infinity. That definitely wouldn't go to infinity. Okay, that wouldn't. So to check your work to show that, what you're going to do is go, all right, well, let's divide everything by the largest power in the denominator. Now, don't trick yourself here. The largest power in the denominator is not x to the fourth. It's not x to the fourth. What is it? Yeah, the way you can think about it. Cover up the rest of it. Look at the largest term. What's the square root of x to the fourth? It's x squared. That's your largest power. It's the square root of that because it's inside a square root. So divide everything by that. I'm making you do this because I want you to see one more time this, this setup. Notice we're dividing by x squared. If I divide this by x squared, is that going to work here? Is this okay? No. Can I take that inside of that square root? Okay, so think back to what we did. This is fine, right? This is fine. That's, that's great. That's what we like. What does this do? What now? Oh, oh okay. We get stuck. Uh -oh. Square root of x to the fourth. Square root of x to the fourth would be great. Did you say that already? Yeah. I was thinking. I was. My mind was wandering. So <laughs> I was thinking about the Simpsons. Um, so, well, since this is x squared and this is x squared, we need to make this equal to x squared, but it also has to have a square root around it. You follow? You can't just do this because that's x. So change the power. Is that true? Now, some of you are going to ask me, well, wait a second, Mr. Leonard, don't you have to have some absolute value here? Let me ask you this question. <coughs> is this always true? That actually is always true, no matter what. No absolute value needed because you have all positive, all positive. It's always going to be the same. Does that make sense? So we don't even need that for this case. So here we're going to have... I just wanted you to see that one time. 2 over x squared, all over. We're going to have the square root. If you think about it, this is going to be 1 plus 2 over x to the fourth. Do you see the 1 plus 2 over x to the fourth? Yes, no? Yeah. We get the 1 x to the fourth over x to the fourth plus the 2 over x to the fourth plus 1. Show of hands, how many people feel okay getting down to that far? Well, that's not many. Let's have some questions if you guys are, are not so, so okay on this. Are you okay on rationalizing? <coughs> yeah? Are you okay on crossing those things out? Well, that should be easy. That's the fun part. Are you okay on dividing by x squared because that is the largest power in your denominator? Are you okay on doing the square root of x to the fourth? 
because that's still x squared. Then we take it inside, we have x to the fourth over x to the fourth. That's one. Two over x to the fourth, two over x to the fourth. x squared over x squared, that's one. Where does this go, ladies and gentlemen, when we're taking it to infinity? Where does that go? Zero. Zero. Is it okay to have zero on the top of a fraction? Yes. Where does this go? Where does this go? Where does this go? Would you agree that this denominator goes to two? So this equals zero over two or zero. You're going to notice in this case, if I change that to a negative, nothing about this changes. I don't have any absolute value. Nothing changes. That says the horizontal asymptote in both directions is at zero. That's what it's going to be. You follow me on that one? Would you like to see one more case? Yeah. Yeah. So, would that be all positive uh, exponents? Or even exponents? Uh, would that be the case? We just start with the even one there. That was, I'm sorry, odd one there. That was even. Even divided by it. Oh, I don't know. It really depends on what you have. I can't say a cover all situation for every time. I don't know. Shall we change the problem just a little bit? Let's change the problem just a little bit, all right? So what I'm going to do, instead of doing a whole completely new one, do you have any questions on this? We're going to see how it changes if I do this little bit to it. That. Okay? If that changes our problem at all. Let's see the things that change. Let's go through our problem. I'll try to use a different color pen so you see the differences. Can you still rationalize? What's well, the only thing that changes about our rationalization? That's going to be uh, <coughs> x squared and x squared. Are you all right with that so far? Okay. What changes here, ladies and gentlemen, when I distribute? What changes? Just an x squared. You see it? It would be kind of silly to do the whole example again, right? It's pretty much the same thing. That would be an x squared, and this would be an x squared. You still okay? Well, what happens here then is this is an x squared, and that's an x squared. True? Okay. So, okay, well, well hang on a second then. Well, if that's the case, Are we still going to be dividing by x squared down here? Yeah, because that's still the largest power. That's, that's not. That actually, if you looked at it, would be x. The square root of x squared is x. So that wouldn't be the largest power. We still divide by x squared. We still divide by x squared. But now I have an x squared right there. That 2x squared, that's right there. This would look almost the same, except I have an x squared there. What that means is I'll have a limit as x approaches positive infinity of 2 over, this is going to give you 1, plus 2 over x squared. You know, I'll show all the work for you in case you're having trouble following me. x to the fourth over x to the fourth plus 2x squared over x to the fourth, x squared over x squared. Are you guys satisfied with that one? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, good. This gives you 1. So we're still at 2. That gives you 1. This gives you 2 over x squared. And that gives you 1. We're now ready to take the limit. Ready to let the x go to infinity. What happens to our 2? Does it go to 0? It didn't last time because we had an over x. Where's that go? Where's that go? Where's that go? What is it? We've got a 2 over the square root of 1 plus 0 plus 1. 1 plus 0 plus 1. That's the square root of 1. That's 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. We get 2 over 2. Did it change? So, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So that, that little change there said we're not at 0 anymore. We have a horizontal asymptote at now 1. So we're going at 1 for at, when we get to infinity. How do you feel okay with what we've talked about so far? 
one. Is it making sense so far? Can you follow that? Shane, you okay? There's no such thing as conjugate here. Um, this is nothing to distribute. Multiply it by itself. On the top and the bottom, you should. Turn into a limit. Just think about it for a second. No derivatives. <laughs> oh, good try, though. When you really have an answer, just derivative. Good try. That's one of those five percent. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, close. No. Huh? Why? It's going to. You have a negative under the square root. Ah. So if I take really big positive numbers, subtract them from seven, are they going to be positive or negative? Negative. And they're under a square root. It doesn't exist. That was the easiest problem of the day. Come on. No, it doesn't exist. So think about your limits. I mean, you can think of them like that. You have a 7 minus something huge. 7 minus something huge is something really negative. Square root of something negative is undefined, therefore limit does not exist. Does that make sense? Now, if I did this, it's not harder. It's the same idea. You have 7 plus a really big number. The 7 plus a really big number, so <coughs> that is still a really big number. It's infinity. All right, so you can, you can think of that. The only problems you really come up with is when you do things like infinity plus or minus infinity, infinity over infinity, uh, that sort of thing gets you. You can't do those. But if you know it's going to infinity or it's not going anywhere, that's fine. That's okay. You can, you can consider things like that. There's no denominator, nothing to divide by. You're good. Does that make sense? So negative infinity would still be... This, no, this is actually... Oh, it's possible. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel okay with our limits? Have I blown your minds yet today? Yeah. <laughs> so, when you have issues where you're subtracting infinities, rationalize them. If you have a square root, rationalize them. If you don't think through the limit what it means to go to infinity, consider the type of problems you have. You already know polynomials, any polynomial is going to go to positive or negative infinity, right? We talked about that last time. He said, well, it follows really the leading coefficient, or leading term, sorry, the power of leading term. So uh, x cubed, if it's, it's going to go up, or if it's negative x cubed, it's going to go down, and things like that happen. So be prepared for those limits. Are there any questions before we continue?